Damon Lindelof's sci-fi epic Watchmen leads the pack at this year's Emmy nominations with six nominations, sorry, 26 nominations. It's a captivating spectacle about racism and identity and trauma and violence. And, uh, and the critics loved it, fans loved it. I'm Rob Lucuria, Senior Editor at Goldie. I'm here with costume designer Sharon Davis. Sharon, first of all, congratulations on your Emmy nomination. Oh, thank you so much. I'm very excited about this one. Um, where, t talk us through the morning of when you found out you were nominated. Oh, I was getting ready to go on a run <laughs> because I was so nervous. <laughs> and as I was running, you know, I, uh, the, the calls kept coming in and it was just like, how many, how many nominations? I mean, I really didn't, I didn't even know I was nominated until an hour later because we had so many nominations for Watchmen. It was so exciting. Damon is a, a genius. Yeah, he really is, isn't he? And I'm, I'm very happy for him and the whole team because uh, obviously the show has really resonated with fans and critics and uh, the, obviously the Academy really loved it and nominated it across the board. Um, you're nominated alongside uh, Valerie Zielonka for the pilot. It's summer and we're running out of ice. Generally speaking, pilots are typically quite challenging, aren't they? Because you're setting the tone, you're establishing characters and you're building that world, aren't you? Oh, it was unbelievable when I read it. I just said I have to attempt to tackle the, you know, the the realness of the of the history and the creative part of the story. I mean, combining he combined three different elements in one pilot. So it was so scary and <laughs> but I was ready to dig in. Yeah that, that's right there's so much to unpack in the pilot because you've got a lot some of obviously the work with the um the vigilante superheroes whatever you want to call them like uh, like Sister Knight you've got the Fifth Cavalry Adrian Veidt and then um <clears throat> 1920s Tulsa it was like doing a feature um all uh, with, with, with so many different looks that you had to cover. And I thought we could just focus on a few of them um, in a bit more uh, granularity. Let's start with Sister Knight, played by Regina King, um, AKA Angela Abar. Talk us through the process of getting her look right. Oh boy. It always comes down to the mask. <laughs> you know, Regina, even though she is so petite, she is such a big personality. It was amazing that she could wear all this black and this skirt that was like a cape. So we, the challenge wasn't so much there. The challenge was all in the headpiece and the, and the mask. And it just became, you know, at the 11th hour, um, less was better. And it just worked out amazing. We just spray painted across her eyes and then just made a very gauzy black mask and it just looked fantastic. Yeah, because it, yeah. it, it's really quite a simple look if you think about the elements, but uh, it's so effective. Um, you know, she's got the rosary beads that she kind of uses as a weapon and she, it's like a balaclava type situation where the nuns have it. Like it just, uh, what inspired that look, apart from obviously the source material and, try, and, and you know, other looks from all the different other vigilantes, what, what, what else were you going for in trying to make it look so imposing and, uh, and kind of nefarious even? Well, we were also going back to a, a little, uh, we went back when her backstory, which showed in a different episode, that her parents had passed away and she was raised by a few nuns. So I was trying to inspire that look inside of this costume. And she was, a, you know, a police officer that was at one time wearing a uniform before they had to hide behind the costumes. So I wanted something that she would feel really protected. And I wanted to design something that looked so protected that there was so much going on. You, you probably could not find the real person in that costume. And so that was my inspiration for um, coming up with the concept. Um, also, I really wanted to have a 70s feel, a 1970s kind of hook, like a, not so much exploitation, but I, I just wanted to have like that 70s. We were kind, we were doing an alternate reality where we were trying to have the 70s influence a lot of our fashion. So I was really going for that. 
Yeah, that, I'm so glad you said that because that's exactly the kind of vibe that I was getting from a lot of the show, particularly Sister Night. Like at first I thought, oh, are we going for that black exploitation kind of vibe? But it, it, it really isn't that. It kind of, you just get hallmarks of it to begin with and then you realise it's something completely different. Um, how satisfying is it when you're, when you're uh, designing the look of the, you know, the main character uh, and then you finally see it on the big screen? Regina King's performance is so exceptional. Uh, were you satisfied with the way that it turned out when you finally saw the pilot? I was so excited when I saw the pilot. Um, Regina King is such a phenomenal actress and just a wonderful person. And she just adapted so well to the costume. It was a, like a second skin to her. I never felt that she ever looked uncomfortable in this costume. So I was very pleased. And um, I think she is. <laughs> and we were, we were very excited that we could actually spin off these DIY costumes. I mean, the point was that they should have looked like they were all made at home. There was no you know, amazing Marvel looking costume here. They were all things that these guys just kind of created to disguise themselves. Yeah, that's the, that's the key. Cause they're, they're things that they've kind of rustled up in their homes, but then once they kind of get come together, they do look quite imposing and um, yeah, it really does work. Let's talk about something that is not quite in the same vein and that's the Vite costumes. Um, they share a lot of similarities with the graphic novel source material, but I think um, you, you, you have, there are some elements that kind of set it apart from that. Do you want to talk us through what you were looking for when you were fleshing out his look? Well, I really, I only did the first part of the series. So, I mean, I only did the pilot. So his first look I did was when he was in the castle when we had, which made no sense. I mean, all of a sudden we jumped to this castle with this man who's dressed quite nicely and, you know, his dinner suit and a riding outfit. And, and that was, you know, very eloquent, eloquent and timeless. We, we went that way with him just to show he was not with everybody else. He had to be somewhere or was it some different time? You know, we wanted the audience to guess, are we going back in time or are we really still in the present? So we, we kind of made it like a cliffhanger for it, for the pilot for him. Yeah. I, I, that, I, um, I was so puzzled by uh, so much of the Vite storyline, obviously, until we get um, further and further into the series. And I think, yeah, his look is, completely different. We don't really see a lot of the sci-fi elements until a little bit later, but in the beginning we do see him in this weird country uh, estate. And um, yeah, there would have been quite a lot of work uh, to be done on that. But I, let, let's actually talk about, the, to me, the highlight of the pilot, and that is the, the, uh, the sepia tones of 1920s Tulsa, brought to life like never before. And, you know, thinking about costuming were you very mindful about being historically accurate with the look of black wall street back in the day i we all were extremely mindful to broach this subject we wanted it to be as realistic as it was the day it happened um i i really chose to use more subtle and faded out colors and tones so i would also assist the more sepia tone um, film stock that we were using. Um, I wanted it to look as real as possible. I, I really would just wash everything down and made sure nothing looked crisp and new. So you would never, I wanted the audience to feel like they were there, which is a horrible thing, but it was a horrible event in the US history. And I really wanted people to feel the, uh, fear and the hate that was going on at that time. Did, were there any particular challenges at all in bringing some of these, those characters, particularly even the extras, because you know, there was quite a lot of people uh, uh, when, when those scenes were being shot, uh, in terms of dressing them all and designing all of their looks, was there anything in particular that you found difficult? Well, it was very challenging as these clothes are not the most easy patterns to make. And I had to make at least 30 to 40 people in multiples of four or five so we can reshoot it again and again. 
and you know we had like a short time we had four weeks to create all that so it was a very challenging to design and construct the dresses for all these women yeah um you know as an african-american what how do you feel about shining a spotlight on black wall street and this massacre that a lot of people didn't really know anything about um i felt it was very important to bring out this this uh part of history i mean we did this two years ago before the black lives matters movement and um when, when it was released, my brothers and sisters were horrified <laughs> that I would have done, worked on such a project. And they didn't even know it was real. And I got a lot of um, people responding to me thinking that we had made this up. I mean, it was, it was so sad and so enlightening that no one, I mean, not very many people were, you know, knowledgeable of this history. Yeah. And the fact that it was done two years ago and the world has moved on somewhat um, in terms of various uh, social issues since that. And it's, it, it really kind of emphasizes how prescient and how relevant the show actually is. It's a sci-fi spectacle, but it's so much more than that. What do you think about how the show speaks to the world we're living in right now? Oh, I just am. I, I, when I watched the rest of the series and the way Damon unfolded this whole story, it speaks so much truth to now, like this year, 2020, as if he predicted that this was going to be needed. I mean, each of these characters, I mean, everything seemed to gravitate around uh, such an energy like we're having right now. Yeah, it says so many profound things about prejudice and violence, identity and race. Um, and, and even when I saw this at the end of last year, it, it seemed like, oh, isn't oh, these people look so bizarre with their masks on. And now that is like <laughs> everywhere. Like, does that blow your mind? This whole thing, there's three aspects that blow my mind. Yes, the Black Lives Matter, the COVID-19 mask and the chat, I mean, it was so challenging to make all these masks for the series that it took us like the yellow mask on the cops. Uh, that was like a hundred samples before I came up with the right one. You know, it was all about mask, really the whole <laughs> series. That's where I would get hung up. And it just is amazing how it's there everywhere now. But you didn't like, it seems like such a simple thing, a bit of material, material, and it, had, it felt like it was a bit elasticized that they would just pull up over their faces. But talk us through that it actually, it wasn't just a simple thing of just finding some material and throwing it on people's faces. You had to think about functionality and also how it looked on the screen, the yellow on the cops. And yeah, the yellow colors. was so important as it, we wanted to really the yellow smiley face from the graphic novel is where I was trying to capture my yellow. The second thing is the mask came from below the neck and up. So I wanted to really make sure it didn't get wobbly around the neck. So every individual had actually a different fitting mask. They had to be almost tailor made to each person. So that was, that was a, a lot of work. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. And then the masks that some of the vigilantes wear, as you said earlier, appear quite uh, homemade or things that they would find in a costume box on purpose. Right. But then um, looking glasses, uh, really interesting luminescent head covering. Oh Where did that come from? What were you trying to go for with that? Just say 200 masks later. <laughs> <laughs> we decided we found a lame that worked or a, like a silver lame and then they just cgi'd the effect on top because i was looking for a fabric that would reflect what he was seeing but it was you know i'd get like a minimal effect but i also wanted to make sure you saw the silhouette of his face so we did find the look work but it just needed a little enhancement through the movie magic. <laughs> yeah. Um, a lot of people probably don't fully appreciate 
some of the daily challenges that the costume department has. So we, a lot of people will understand you design things on paper or on screens and then you, you make them and you see if you can ex extrapolate, you change things up. But what are the daily, like, are there other things that we may not be aware of that you are go going through daily when you're shooting the pilot where things come up that you don't quite appreciate or expect when you're designing? Well, I mean, one of the um, biggest challenges is late casting or the actor or actress they cast is not available to the day of or the day before. And then you have this elaborate costume that really needs like a week of fine tuning. That's one of the biggest challenges. The second challenge was we were shooting in Atlanta and uh, one of the locations was really far on the farm. <laughs> yeah. and we shot there a lot and then we did not only have 1920s we also had 1880s in a silent movie with Bass Reeves and they we had to move up our production six weeks ahead <laughs> and I had to <laughs> that made me only have two weeks for that scene so um, it's like you have to be on your toes and you can't look at the uh, master schedule and think that that's going to stay the same. Oh my God, that sounds exhausting. Actors schedules and thus change. <laughs> yeah, things change and you're constantly on your feet running around making sure that you can deliver. Um, yeah, that sounds uh, really exhausting. Um, let's go back into time a little bit if we can. Um, so you were nominated at the Oscars in 2005 for Ray and then again in 2007 for Dreamgirls. Very, very different designs, both musical or at least based on something to do with the music industry, which is interesting. Um, then you were nominated um, in 2018 for Westworld at the Emmys. But let's talk about the Oscars. When you're nominated, what... What is that like to be um, always now referred to as Oscar nominee, Sharon Davis? <laughs> I'm, I, you know, Ray was never really in the Oscar consideration or talk. So when I got the call at six in the morning, I, my, my, you know, my heart went to my throat. <laughs> I've never thought that, but it, it did change the whole way of, of my whole way of life as a costume designer and how people thought of me in the industry. Um, I, I was always, you know, I like to, I like my work to show I'm not so much about me coming out. <laughs> yeah. And so I had to learn how to be out in the public eye. Yeah, I guess that's right. And it probably opens a lot of doors for you. You obviously then got to work on Westworld, which was so, there's so much to unpack on Westworld um, back in 2018. And speaking of, um, this year's category that you're nominated in, the sci-fi fantasy category, features some really strong work, not only by yourself, but the designers on The Handmaid's Tale, Carnival Row, uh, The Mandalorian and Westworld again. Um, are you yeah. as blown away as I am by the quality of the work that we're seeing these days on television? I really am. Um, most of those shows you mentioned are some of my favourite shows and some are designed by some of my really good friends, so I'm really excited to be in the same category as them and also dreading it <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be it's a really competitive race and uh but you know i think the best thing about it is that you you and the others uh were nominated um at the, the academy felt that that was that you, you should be recognized for your work and so we, we congratulate you and, and good luck on every night thank you so much thank you now, everybody go to goldderby.com and make your predictions, click subscribe and watch all of our great contender chats just like this one with Sharon.